Thank you. I'll, I'll just use this. Thank you very much, and I consider it an honor to be here. I really appreciate uh, the invite and uh, hope that something that I say can in, inspire others. Uh, I do have roots in Cache Valley. Uh, my great-great-grandfather Samuel uh, helped settle Smithfield. He was the first recorder of the temple here in Logan, and so that is where my roots are in the United States. So I do feel a sense of being home here. I grew up in Chicago, a place where there are zero mountains. The highest point in the state of Illinois is man-made. Uh, when I was growing up, it was called the Sears Tower. It was the tallest in the world for quite a while. Now it's called Willis Tower, and it's way down the list. It's not the tallest in the world anymore. So uh, how on earth did I get into mountaineering? Uh, maybe I'll share a little bit about that, but when I was about 13, I was driving out with some friends here to Utah, and I saw mountains on I-80. I, I saw uh, some of the uh, mountains in Wyoming, and it was, as, it was as if angels were singing in my voice saying, you must go there. So uh, ever since then, I've been climbing. I went to the other Blue University to the south of us uh, for my undergraduate uh, work, and then I went to the Red University for grad school, and I, I currently teach there. I'm adjunct faculty at the, at the U as well. So uh, I always start off my presentations uh, by giving a uh, hearty namaste. So uh, generally what you do is you put your hands together like this and bow and say namaste. So I'll say namaste to you, and then you have to say it back. So namaste. Excellent. And it, it means the goodness in me recognizes the goodness in you. It, it's a very fun saying. It's very, very typical in Nepal and India for people to say namaste. That is a very typical greeting. In the States here, it's, hey, how are you doing? We don't really mean it. And uh, in, in Nepal, you actually feel that they mean it. And there's just so much love there. When I talk about Nepal, uh, I start sounding like the travel council for the country, and I'm not. It's just a fabulous place to go. Uh, this is not hyperbole, because uh, I'm sure many of you here are kind of adventurous. Has it, who's been to Nepal? Anybody been to Nepal? Drake, you can raise your hand because you've been to Nepal. <laughs> My son is back there. Uh, but uh, if you haven't been to Nepal, if you absolutely want a life-changing experience, uh, you could go and trek from Lukla to Everest Base Camp or near it. You don't have to go all the way to base camp, but you can trek in that region and it will change your perspective. It will change your outlook on life. If you spend two weeks there, you will come back a different person. And I, you won't come back a worse person, you'll come back a better version of yourself. People are so friendly there and they're so loving. Uh, when I have people come visit from out of state or out of the country to Utah, they say there's something special, there's something different about people in Utah. You feel the same way about people in, in Nepal. So have I kind of sold you on Nepal a little bit maybe? <laughs> Hopefully, I don't know. All right, so I wanna talk about this for just a quick second. Uh, why do hard things? Uh, so this is Pope Pius XI, and uh, this was from quite a while ago. And I like his, I like his quote because it's as true today as it was when he said this uh, over 100 years ago. He said, all life demands struggle. Those who have everything given to them become lazy, selfish, and insensitive to the real values of life. The very striving and hard work that we so constantly try to avoid is the major building block in the person we are today. I think it's as true today as it was 100 plus years ago. Uh, incidentally, this pope, uh, you don't normally think this when you think popes, but this pope uh, was a climber. And on Mont Blanc, there is a route called the Pope Route. And uh, he would climb the Pope Route uh, on the Italian side of the Alps there for Mont Blanc. So it's kind of interesting to think about that. But I love, I love this quote uh, from him right there. So I, have, I was kind of raised to difficult things. I like doing difficult things. I like the challenge uh, of doing difficult things. So I'd say probably about 20 years ago or so, I set a goal to climb the, the seven summits, which is the, the high point of each uh, continent. And so, uh, of course, Everest is one of them. That's what I'm going to primarily focus on and talk to you guys a little bit about here. Uh, but you can see the different mountains throughout the world. I, I, when I set a goal to climb Everest, I knew you couldn't just go up there and climb that because, you, you, quite frankly, if you don't have any experience, there's a really high likelihood you're going to die. And so I, I started by climbing lots of other, other mountains first, and I really, really enjoyed it. I love being in the mountains. I love how I feel. I love the sense of accomplishment. Uh, it's just wonderful to, to do things like that and challenge yourself. Uh, so I did something a little bit different. Uh, I climbed seven summits, but I also did two additional ones. And the reason for that is if you look right here, there's Mount Elbrus. 
And this is Mont Blanc. Some people don't consider this the high point of Europe, so people will climb Mont Blanc as well. And being an overachiever that I, that I am, I climb Mont Blanc. The other one down here, if you can see that, that's Kosciuszko and that's in Australia. Uh, some people don't consider uh, New Zealand and Papua New Guinea as part of the greater continent of Oceania. So if you ask an Aussie, what continent is New Zealand on? They say, well, it's not, it's its own thing. And say, well, <laughs> everybody else recognizes Oceania as the, as the greater continent here. So uh, a lot of people will do both Karsten's Pyramid and Kosciuszko. So I did nine. Uh, to give you an idea, people ask this, this uh, frequently, how many people have done this? All nine, probably about 30 or 40 people in the world have done this. Uh, as far as Everest is concerned, since we're just talking stats for a minute, because sometimes people like to hear this, uh, there's about 24 Utahns that have summited Everest, and we all know each other, and we have like a secret handshake and high five and stuff like that that we do. <laughs> uh, and then uh, probably seven summiters, people that have climbed all seven in Utah, there's only uh, like four of us, so it's, a, it's an even smaller group, and we have an even extra special handshake, high five, and things like that that we <laughs> <laughs> we, we all kind of know each other. And then in the U.S., there's probably about 50 to 75 people that have done the Seven Summit. So it's not a big uh, club to join. So I finished that in 2016. Uh, I went down to Antarctica, and you can barely see it on the bottom of the screen. You can see it over there, but Mount Vincent's the high point of Antarctica. I loved my experience in Antarctica. And when I finished, I said, well, what's next? What can I do next? And I started researching a little bit more, and there was a thing called the Seven Volcanic Summits that a handful of people had completed. And I thought, well, that sounds kind of cool. So I started climbing volcanoes. And if you know anything about geology, you know volcanoes and mountains form very differently. And so that's, that's kind of its own challenge. So I, I start off by climbing Pico de Orizaba outside of Mexico City. And you'll notice that it's a pretty high mountain. It has permanent glacier on it. And those of you that uh, have forgotten your, or your geology, this is all North America. So Mexico and Central America is also considered part of North America, if you were unaware. Uh, in South America, the high point is Ojos del Salado, and that is actually the high, high point of South America, but it's also the highest volcano in the world. Uh, and it's pretty high up there. It's almost 23,000 feet. Uh, the high volcano of Africa, you get a double whammy. You get Kilimanjaro and you get, uh, uh, for both the volcanic summits and the seven summits, same with Elbrus, that's a volcano, so you get a, a double whammy with that. The difficult one for Americans is Mount Damavand, and Mount Damavand sits in Iran. And so if you're up to date on what's going on in world politics right now, you know that Iran is not a spectacular place to go for Americans or really anybody at the, at the moment. Uh, I was fortunate enough to go in 2018. Uh, we, we did a peace climb where there were six Americans climbers and six Iranian climbers. You wouldn't realize it, but uh, Iran has some really high mountains. The, this, the Damavand is 18,403 feet, so it's pretty high. And there's a lot of mountains. You wouldn't, you wouldn't also anticipate this either, but when you fly into Tehran, it reminded me a lot, just the surrounding, not the city itself, but the surroundings reminded me of Salt Lake quite a bit, just mountains surrounding it. And it actually snows in Tehran. You wouldn't think that. I think most people think Baghdad or something like that, but it's nothing like that at all. I had a spectacular, very pleasant experience in Iran. Everybody was extremely nice. Nobody's paying me to say this. <laughs> they were very, very nice. And I wish we could get relations between our countries. Everybody we talked to, they, first of all, they were freaking out because we were Americans. Uh, and then they were all saying, look, we realize it's not the people, it's the governments. And I said, yes, that's essentially it. People were, they invited us to the house for dinner. They were so kind and nice to us. So I felt very fortunate to be able to go to Iran. Uh, and then the high volcano of Oceania is Mount, Mount Gilloway. And I went and did that last summer. And about a mm, year, year and a half ago, I, I started looking at, the, or maybe two years ago, I started looking at this as a goal. I started researching it more and realized no American had done this yet. And I think it's because of, of Iran. So I just came back, you can't see it down here, but this is Mount Sidley in Antarctica. You can see it over there on that side screen or the side screen, if you look over there. Uh, I was successful in climbing Mount Sidley. I literally was just there last week. I've been back about eight days now. I came back last Wednesday, summited that. Uh, and that squarely puts me as the first American to summit the seven high volcanoes throughout the world. So I've got that on my resume. I'm, I, I feel pretty good about that. 
So people say, what are you going to do next? Uh, that's what I want to do next. I want to go to the high point of the moon. Um, uh, and I'm glad people are chuckling uh, because uh, if you know, how many of you know who Jim Harbaugh is? Who's heard of Jim Harbaugh before? He's a football coach from Michigan. And I've heard him speak a couple of times and he's said, if you aren't setting your goals large enough to cause people to kind of chuckle or laugh when you say them, then your goals aren't big enough. And I, I, I believe that. And so I'm glad that there was some snickering. I fully expect that because this is kind of a funny thing to throw out there. But the high point of the moon was only identified about 10 years ago. And uh, it, here's another picture. If you can see that, you can clearly see, is there, is there enough resolution? You can look over to the right. You can see this is from one of the Apollo missions in 1970 uh, or 71. You can clearly see there's, there's mountains on the moon. Uh, I have thought through this. I don't think you're going to put on a backpack and hike to the high point of the, of the moon. What you're going to do is you're going to drive something to the high point of the moon. So this was an electric vehicle. Uh, this is from 1971. It still is uh, this is called a, a lunar rover. It still is up there on the moon. This was electric, so that was kind of ahead of its time in the day. And if you check this out right there, there it is driving on the moon. So. My job now that I've finished the seven volcanic summits is to convince Elon Musk to design something electric to drive to the high point of the moon. I think he's just quirky enough that he would probably do something like that or bite off on it. So uh, that is my next goal. Now that I've finished this one, I'm going to move on to this next and see if I can convince him to design something to drive to the high point of the moon, put an American flag up there and say we've arrived or however you want to say that. So we'll see what happens. That's my next goal anyway. Uh, I, I want to talk about Everest for just a few minutes here. And I should have said this when I started, but uh, I know this is an hour. What I was going to do is talk for about 40 minutes. And then if we want to open it up to questions, more than happy to do that. Uh, it, I haven't, this is probably the 200th time I've given a presentation like this. And I haven't had one yet where people haven't had questions. So if you want to ask questions at the end, uh, so somebody give me the cue when we're at about 40 minutes or something like that and let me know and, and we'll ask, answer questions for a few minutes. So this is Everest right here and you'll notice base camp is 17,500. This is where you start from and just to get there you're hiking up the Kumbu Valley and acclimatizing just to get to that point. When you, when you climb Everest you go from base camp to camp one and you notice that's 19,500 so it's about 200 200 or 2,000 feet, excuse me, uh, distance between the two, and you'll spend the night and then you'll come back down. And you'll rest for a few days and then you'll go do that again and come down. These are called rotations. And then you'll go up to uh, Camp 2 right there and rest for a couple of days, come all the way back down, rest again. It's really draining on your body and you realize really quickly how fragile we are as humans. We were not engineered to live at these elevations whatsoever. Even though you can acclimatize, what you're doing is you're producing more red blood cells, but we were not engineered to live in this, in this environment. That's why people don't live up there. It's not comfortable, you feel horrible, you feel crummy. Uh, you don't really feel awesome even when you acclimatize. And you're not using supplemental oxygen yet. So you're gonna do camp two again, come back down, and then after you rest, you might go up here to camp three and you sleep at camp three uh, for a night. And when you come back down, uh, that's pretty much the signal. If your body can handle sleeping at 23,000 and a half feet, then you know you're ready to go for the summit. So you come down, you rest for about a week. So when you climb Everest, it takes about two months and you rest for about a week and then you wait for your weather window to open up and then you're gonna go for the summit. So it's kind of frustrating because right here, at Camp 3, you can see the summit and you see everything that's going on, but you can't go for it yet because your body is not uh, relaxed and rested uh, up for going for the, for the summit. So when you go for the summit, you go all the way to Camp 3. That's where you start supplemental oxygen. And I actually brought my, um, if you guys would like me to, I will put this on and show you what it looks like. But this is a, this is a mask you wear on Everest when you're, when you're climbing. You guys want me to put it on? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So it goes up like that, and then that would go over like this. The strap should be a little straighter. And then this hose hooks into an oxygen cylinder, and you wear that in your backpack. I wouldn't cross the hose across my body, but I'd put it like this. 
and each of the cylinders contains or it weighs about 12 to 13 pounds and at any given time you're um, you're carrying a couple of these things at a time so there's a lot of weight every ounce matters uh, going up the mountain uh, it makes a big difference so even you're you're thinking through you're calculating through all of this what am I going to carry even down to like snicker bars and you know other other things for uh, energy so that's what you wear uh, when you're when you're climbing the mountain and then you're going for camp camp four or the south call if you read into thin air that's where most of that took place and then there's the the summit right there little video clip here that shows the climb up the mountain so this is the kumbu ice fall right here and that is the they say that's traditionally the most dangerous uh, side of the mountain right there and it's probably true and this is the western coombe it's just wide open there's camp two and then you're going up the Lhotse face this is what i say is the most dangerous part of the climb and that's the yellow band right there that's the geneva spur if you if you know much about or read the mount read about the mountain this is the south call and that's where most of the book into thin air took place that's the balcony right there south summit there's the hillary step and then that's the the summit right there that's the top of the mountain right there so it's almost thirty thousand feet so the next time you're on a delta flight you look out the window that's the view that you can get from the top of everest something like that you're way the heck up there and you feel it you feel how fragile you feel how fragile your your body is so this is a photo and you could go to this spot with I wouldn't say easily, but you could get here relatively, rel with relative ease trekking, just backpacking. You can go to this spot, it's called Kalapatar, and this is about 18,000 feet. If you acclimatize and go slow, you can get here. That's the summit of Everest right there. Base camp is down over here, and you're too close to the mountain to, to see the actual summit of the mountain. So a lot of people will trek right to this point so they can get a view of the mountain. One, th this right here, even though it looks taller, that's a mountain called uh, Noopsy, and it's only like 25, it's a mere 25,000 feet. It's like the 17th tallest in the world, it's not even close. <laughs> but that, that's, the, that's, the, uh, that's the top right there. And one interesting thing about this photo I'll point out is that's cloud, that's cloud, these are all clouds right here. That's actually snow blowing off the summit at about 100 to 150 miles an hour. Uh, the, the wind never stops. It's tall enough that it's in the jet stream. The jet stream is blowing all the time up there and you can hear it at base camp. And it's really disconcerting because you're thinking, how am I gonna go up there? It sounds like a tornado. So one thing I didn't realize before I started really researching the mountain was there's only two weeks out of the year where you can summit from about May 15th to, Ju to June 1st. And the reason for that is there's these big monsoonal storms coming out of the Bay of Bengal in India, and they're pushing north. It's the monsoonal rains, and they're actually significant enough that they push the jet stream aside. So out of that two weeks, you might have four days that you, that you could actually summit. And that's the answer. Everybody asks why it's so crowded. That is why it's so crowded up there, because everybody's trying to go for all of those summit days. So you see all those, those people up there, and you're thinking, why are they doing that? That's why those giant queues up at the top of the mountain like that. So when you leave base camp, you, you go through the Kumbu Ice Fall and you start, you have to climb across these crazy ladders like that. And so I don't know if you can see this one, you might need to look at the screen on the side, but uh, that's two ladders lashed together. And if you, if you look at my hand up here, these are all crevasses and this might be 100 or 200 meters deep. And these ladders are, are over the crevasses like that. So you're having to, to climb up these crazy ladders like this, cross things like that. Uh, this one right here, if you look at that, that's one, two, three, four, five ladders. And they are as rickety as they would seem. You get up on there and they kind of do, you know, this kind of a shake and thing like that. So you have to overcome that and not let that bother you. Uh, I'm going to pass this around, so not only do you have to cross those ladders, but you have to do it with crampons on the bottom of your boot like this. So it's really good to get the one rung here and the other rung there. You don't want to uh, misstep like that. So you guys want me to pass this around?
Okay. It, it's lighter than you would anticipate. And I, I wore those last week when I was climbing Sidley, and I took them out of my bag and they reeked, so I put dryer sheets in them so they don't smell as bad. So don't kind of plug your nose as they're going around. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> so that, that's, the, that's the boots that you wear. I, ice axe, I'll pass that around if you promise not to hit your buddy with it. And then this is, th this is essentially right here what you go up the, the mountain on. I'm sure many of you in here have climbed before. And uh, uh, what you do is this hooks into your, your climbing harness like so. And then you have, I'm sure some of you have used this in here as well. You have an ascender and then a safety line on the front of it. So the whole way up the mountain, there's a fixed line and you climb up with this ascender right, right here. That's how you go up. I'm gonna leave it in an open position. It locks like that. But the open position, you can feel one way is smooth and the other way is really sharp like a cat's tongue. And this, this is a really phenomenal piece of technology. You, you could actually hang like a small Volkswagen, like a beetle, an old beetle. You can hang a beetle from this, uh, you know, from right here off of this uh, ascender. It'll hold about 2,000 pounds and it won't slip. The rope might break, but this isn't gonna break right here. So it's a pretty good piece of technology. I'll pass that around and let you guys take, take a look at it at that. But that's essentially what you use to go up on the mountain. It's not super complicated, nice, nice and simple. You guys have heard of the KISS principle? Keep it simple, stupid. You guys have heard of that before? <laughs> Keep it simple, you don't have to get too crazy with it. That's how, you, that's how you go up on the mountain like that. So this is our view from Camp 3, and we're, we're slowly progressing up the mountain, but we're almost gonna get to the summit here in a second. So this, this is Camp 3 right here, looking down the Western Coombe. And this is about, if you were to misstep and step off of this, that's about 2,000 feet straight down. And it's significant enough that every once in a while somebody will step out of the boot or step out of the tent in their, in their uh, boot liners. I'm not going to open it up for fear of a stink, but inside that boot there's a boot liner and they're made to be super smooth. So in the tent they don't cut things and they're, they're quite slick. I know that sounds ironic, but people will step out to go to the bathroom and unfortunately they've slipped down this to their death. So they're really careful about if you have to get up to go to the bathroom, you tie off. Uh, or you use a pee bottle if you're familiar with the dreaded pee bottle. <laughs> it just is what it is. <laughs> so when you leave Camp 3, Camp 3's down there, you get in line with like 100 of your best friends and you start going up the, the fixed line. The thing about the fixed line, it gives you this false sense of security because if somebody slipped on that and everybody started pulling at the same time, it, the anchor's not going to hold. It's just going to, it's just going to take you down with it. So. It, you're, you're torn between do I want to hook into that thing or just free climb uh, next to it. But you're moving really, really slow. You can see right here this, this line with all these climbers right here. And this was on the way down. So you can see how many, how many climbers are up here. Uh, and, and we were on our way down and these guys are all trying to come up because we had had summit success the day prior and there was good weather report. So these guys all, all, were, going for the, all, all were going for the summit as we, were, as we were descending. And you go up and down the, the same fixed lines uh, right here. Somebody asked the other day, does everybody have to wear red? And the answer is no. You just need some, an opposing color to, uh, to the snow. So I had a blue suit. Some people wore green or yellow or something like that. So there's, there, it doesn't have anything to do with anything having a specific color that I'm aware of. Let me show you this little video news clip here. Look at this scene at Mount Everest. Each of those lights in the distance there, a climber. Four have died, their deaths being blamed on a sort of traffic jam. And ABC's Ron Claiborne tonight and why so many are trying to get to the top right now. These are images from high up on Everest. The path to the peak clogged with climbers, as many as 200, dambling with their very lives. In this time-lapse video, you can see the headlamps of the climbers nearing the 29,000-foot peak. Looking up the Black Mountain, we can see at least a hundred pinpricks of light, all in a vertical line going straight into the stars. The logjam has been caused by so many people rushing to get to the top on the last weekend of the climbing season. But the going is slow and the oxygen runs out quickly as they pass through the notorious death zone of thin air and sub-zero temperatures. National Geographic is documenting the ascent by one of the teams, which today reached the summit, where they took this photo. They also have to pass dozens upon dozens of climbers, a fair number of them have 
no business beyond ever. Some have made it to the top, including a 73-year-old Japanese woman who is now the oldest person to ever climb Mount Everest. But four died this week, and an American climber collapsed on his way down. An Israeli climber found him and abandoned his own summit attempt to carry him to safety. Both are now suffering severe frostbite. Everest dangers are well known. The single deadliest ascent when eight people perished in 1996. When things start going wrong and the clock starts ticking away, that's when things can go wrong in a, in a big way in a, and in a hurry. This year, there are just too many people on the mountain, making the treacherous trek to the top of the world that much more dangerous. Ron Claiborne, ABC News, New York. So this is Camp 4. We're almost to the summit summit here, guys. And uh, it's super, super windy here. And when you leave Camp 4, you're going to go up the, the mountain this direction. So we left, the, the, we left Camp 4 at about 7.30 in the evening. And uh, I wish I had taken this picture, but you can see the headlamps that are going up, up the mountain like that. I cannot take credit for this photo. But that one, if you look, I think you can see it a little bit better on the side screen. That you get for about five minutes as the sun is uh, rising, uh, and that's the shadow over Tibet or China off the far side of the, of the mountain right there. So this is what it looked like as we were going towards the summit. This was on our way up, and uh, I've read the uh, account. Uh, the, the government and all the climbing Sherpas keep track of who summits and when. And we were the, as far as I know, we were the 10th, 11th, and 12th to summit on May 19th in 2013. And if you look at the photo fairly closely, it's hard to see here, but you can see climbers. So this might be like the number one guy, two, three, four, five, six. And there's a couple climbers in here you can't see in the shadows. And then we're 10, 11, and 12 uh, that we summited. So this is 2013, contrasting that with this photo. And this is just last season. So I, I, I've looked at that somewhat closely and you can count close to 120 climbers jamming the same location. This is problematic. This is gonna be a challenge uh, to be up there because you're not gonna be able to move up or down uh, very quickly. You're just gonna to have to get around all these, all these uh, bodies right here. People ask, why is it this way? Remember, there's only four or five days that you can get good weather to go up there and everybody wants to do the same exact thing that you're doing. And so that's why it, it just gets crowded like this. So let me show one more video clip. Dangerous gridlock at the top of the world's tallest mountain. At least five climbers have died over a 48 hour period, including an American. ABC's Julia McFarlane has more. A traffic jam on Mount Everest has now claimed the lives of five climbers in the last three days, including Utah climbing enthusiast John Cash when he suddenly fainted from high altitude sickness Wednesday. Experts say an area known as the death zone, where oxygen measures at one third the normal level, could be to blame. Climbers like mountain guide Garrett Madison wasting hours of precious oxygen as they wait for 150 mile per hour winds to ease. There are probably a couple of hundred climbers up there and it did create some congestion on the route, some delays. Experts tell ABC News supplemental oxygen is an absolute necessity when climbing this part of the mountain that soars over 26,000 feet. Experts say overcrowding at the top of the world is making the mountain more dangerous than ever. This year it's been a particularly windy season and so once the weather window developed and we had a chance to go for the summit everybody went pretty much the same time according to nepal's department of tourism a record-breaking 381 permits were issued this year and with each climber requiring a sherpa to guide them lines reached epic proportions instead of taking maybe 12 hours to do the round trip they were taking 20 hours and when you take that long and you run out of supplemental oxygen it's just a deadly combination the Nepalese government's only requirement for a permit is about 11,000 U.S. dollars. No physical tests are required. So that's one of the challenges people ask about is uh, essentially all you got to do is, is pay enough money. And there are, uh, uh, you know, uh, there are climbing teams that don't have a lot of scruples and they'll just accept you on it, knowing that there's a pretty good chance you're not going to summit. So they're just playing the odds. 
it's a little bit, I, I really like Delta Airlines, I'm not picking on them, but it's a little like what airlines do when they have so many seats and they oversell it and they know only so many people are gonna show up, right? So they're kind of playing statistics, they're playing the odds because they can make more money uh, and, and know that if needs be, they can have people, they can kind of buy people out and, and some of you have probably done that before, they'll give you a little money if they oversell a flight, right? Uh, that can't happen here because they know about 50% of the people are gonna drop out. There's just not enough room for 381 people to climb up there. And, and so they just sell these permits knowing there's not going to be enough room, even with 50% of the people not making it, you know, getting sick or having some kind of other issue before they even get up on the mountain. So I don't have a solution. I don't know what the solution is, but you're going to continue to see deaths like this. So my friend uh, Don Cash, he was from Sandy, uh, he passed away this year. He had a heart attack on the summit. Uh, they were able to get him down close to the Hillary step. He, they revived him, he had another heart attack, and he passed away. And it, they have, the family has chosen to leave the body up there. Uh, people ask, why on earth are you doing that? Uh, it sounds very crass. The, the odds are, and the statistics have shown, uh, it would take nine or 10 individuals to go up, very strong individuals to go up and retrieve a body, and the odds are pretty dang good that one or two of those folks are gonna pass away. So you're, you're trading you know, a, a body for a couple other lives. And that's why most of the most of the folks that die above Camp 4 just get left up there. Uh, to date, I think there's now like 252 bodies that are up there. You don't have to ask this when I open it up to questions. You do see bodies, and I just choose not to focus on it. Uh, but we talked about it before we went up, and they said, you're going to see folks, you know, try not to focus on it. And I, I didn't, I, I just kind of eyes forward. I didn't really want to focus on on the downside of something like that. It was about, I'm not into this at all, but about a year, there was one guy in particular I saw, about a year and a half after I got home, I got curious one day, and there are websites if you want, you can go through and kind of see who was up there. And I, I researched and clicked on this guy and did a little research on him, he was an Italian guy, single, and had, you know, had parents and they chose to leave him up there. So I just was curious, wanted to read a little bit about his life, mostly to honor him, not to be focusing on something macabre or weird or anything like that. So uh, you do see bodies up there and, uh, and it is what it is. So one thing I, I like about this photo, let me mention this photo for a second. Are there any flat earth folks in here? No, okay. So if you look at this photo really closely, what do you notice about the horizon? It, it's a little curved, right? You can see the curve in there. So sorry to break it to you flat earth guys and gals, the, the earth is curved. If I go to the moon, I'm definitely gonna send back some undoctored photos of a curved planet, right? <laughs> so if you zoom in here a little bit more, uh, this is on our way down, and you can start to see all these climbers up here going on the route. My buddy Steve snapped that. That's just me standing right there. And as you zoom in a little closer, you can start to see all these, these climbers. That is the Hillary step uh, right here, if you look up at the main screen. I think I zoomed in on it a little bit better if you can, you can see it right there. So that is actually the, the Hillary step. That's, that's the most difficult uh, section, mostly because of high elevation, uh, and it's not a very difficult climb, it's just that you're at 28,000 feet and you're not thinking clearly, and so some people have fallen from here. Uh, from about here straight down to the deck is about eight or 9,000 feet. Uh, from about this point right here off into China, it's about 12,000 feet. So when I, it was two days after I was there, uh, there, I'm not trying to promote Red Bull in any way, but there was one of those, it was a, like a Russian Red Bull athlete, and he like chugged a Red Bull and jumped off in one of those squirrel suits and, you know, sailed down and then pulled the parachute. So he's one of the extreme athletes for that, but apparently he jumped off from right there. You can see the video online if you want to go see it. I'm not going to show it in here, but you can, if you're interested, you can go see it. So that is the view from the very top uh, right before we were starting to come down. And you can see all these lines forming at the top of the Hillary step right there. So we were fortunate enough. Uh, we had, that's the summit photo right there. We had perfectly uh, blue sky, very, very little wind whatsoever at the top and uh, just absolute uh, perfect conditions. I live in a little town called Alpine and there is another Alpiner who has summited. His name's Greg Paul. He's a good friend of mine. He's the first uh, ever summiter to climb with two artificial knees. 
but I beat him, so every time I see him, I kind of do that to him as the first alpiner to summit. <laughs> He's a very, very nice guy. Uh, I always take uh, the U.S. flag to the summit as well, and uh, usually have like the summit team uh, sign off on it, uh, whatnot, before uh, I, I take it back to the United States. So I'm very proud to be an American. I like that. Uh, this, I want to show this. this. This is my version of, of fake news here for a second. So do you notice that summit photo there where it says American dies on Everest? So th this was on the news this summer, and I got a couple texts from friends saying, hey, are, are you alive? And I said, yeah, why? Uh, well, ABC News says differently. And I said, well, I'm not dead. So <laughs> I, I got online and saw this and... Uh, you know, of course, it, it's, a little bit, it's a little bit humorous to see that. This was the reporting on Don Cash, who had passed away. And uh, it, it doesn't bother me now. It didn't really bother me then. But I had a couple friends say, hey, I have a son. He's in Brazil on a mission right now uh, for the church. And they said, what happens if your mom or your son sees this and, ha and is not in touch with you and kind of freaks out? And I said, well, that's a good point. So I reached out to ABC News and said, hey, guys, would you this is my photo, would you mind correcting this? And uh, I just sent it at night, I didn't know anybody at ABC. The next morning I had an email, yes, we're terribly sorry, I apologize, so uh, what can we do? And I said, well, just print a retraction. So ABC News was nice enough to tweet and uh, also put it on their Facebook page, but it says, due to an editing error, an incorrect image was used in Thursday's broadcast. Story about an American climber who died on Everest featured an image of another climber, me, who is alive and well. ABC News apologizes to Mr. Ross Kelly. So it was very kind of them. This is fake news at its finest. You don't want any of this kind of stuff going on. But uh, I thought they were very, very, at least very kind to kind of set the record straight. So I, I'm still not offended by it. Uh, and then this is, this is the summit shot uh, right here. People ask, how big is the summit? How much room is at the top? And, and this is a good image of kind of how exactly how much room there is. You'll notice that's an Indian flag. It's not even really blowing at the top. So we had just about as good a conditions as you could get. It, it was about like this room in here, but it was 25 or 30 below zero. So it, it was cold, but it was very tolerable. And I'm not complaining one bit. I think we had just about perfect weather. You can see there's not even a cloud in the sky. Even coming down, you know, we had, we had perfect weather. So this is, people always ask, what's at the very top? That is the very top of Everest right there. And uh, so there are uh, at least three faiths that, ha that believe their deity resides at the top of the mountain here. And so they very politely, we have a, a liaison from the government who works with our team and he very politely asked us not to stand on the summit, which I did not do. So I did not stand on the summit. But I will tell you that I reached over very carefully and touched that little spire point right there because I'm not going back and I wasn't going to have anybody tell me I didn't go all the way to the summit. So I did go out of my way to reach over and, and touch that little point up there. Uh, before I left to go, I left on a Sunday and uh, uh, I was scoutmaster in our uh, religious congregation and uh, our bishop announced I was leaving. And so some of the scouts came over and were kind of talking to me. And one of our scouts is, he's kind of a special needs young man. And he, he shows up with a paper airplane this big and says, would you fly that from the summit? And I said, so Adam, I love you, but you're going to have to make one a little smaller. And I will. So he made me a tiny one about that big. And I tucked it in my coat. And I, I did take it to the summit. And I threw it. And all it did was go like that. So I, I picked it up again and threw it and a little bit of a breeze took it and it kind of flew it away somewhere like that. But I told him I, I flew it and it went like three miles out over China. So <laughs> don't give the secret away to, to Mr. Adam. <laughs> I had another one of my deacons. He's definitely an interesting young man. He was a little tougher, a little rowdier. And uh, he showed up at my door probably half an hour before I left and he had a laminated picture of his Nana who had passed away. And he wrote on the back, I love you, Nana. He said, would you, he was kind of a little emotional. He said, would you take this to the summit and leave it? And I said, sure, I will. <laughs> Absolutely. I just wasn't expecting it. So I did take a picture for, uh, of his Nana who had passed and left it at the summit up there. There's a whole bunch of stuff up there. You'd be surprised how much stuff is up there. People ask, how does this stay on the summit? And the answer is... 
uh, it fills in with snow. So all of that stays uh, covered with snow. And it's just certain times of the year when the sun comes out that it melts off really quickly like that because the sun is super, super intense at that elevation. You can't even take off your glasses or your goggles because it'll burn your eyes in like a minute or two. So thankfully I had some folks say, no, you gotta keep your, keep your goggles and glasses on, which I did uh, because you can burn your eyes up super quick. So you have to be careful, careful with that. Okay, two more slides left. Uh, this slide right here, uh, I show this uh, and here's why. Uh, for six or seven spring breaks, uh, our family, uh, among a bunch of other families, went down to uh, Tijuana in Mexico. And uh, we would take part in a service opportunity. So if you look up here on the screen, uh, these folks right here, uh, this family was living on this site, if you want to call it that, before, before we, were, we showed up. And they had like a uh, patio umbrella and uh, some uh, Rubbermaid things they were using as sinks and just some bad la la you know, lawn furniture and stuff. That's how they were living. And uh, so uh, my friend Brad, who is right here, he has a charity. And uh, the idea of the charity is you go down there for a week and uh, you build this wonderful house in the space of a week. And so we went, we did this, I think, seven, seven spring breaks in a row. And so uh, there's, uh, that's my son, Drake, who happens to be sitting back there. And uh, that's my son, Riker, Porter, there's me. And then my wife is right there. So we had just a wonderful experience doing this. I don't remember what number trip this was, uh, but just had a wonderful experience. I have the fondest memories of this experience and just the, the, the greatest feeling of accomplishment and achievement. And here's the secret. This is why I show this picture. I look at this picture and I am more proud of this and I feel better about accomplishing this than I do all the climbs that I've done. That should tell you something right there. I have a better feeling and better accomplishment in my life serving and helping other people that are less fortunate than me. So if you take nothing away from me today, I want you to think about that. I've done all these other climbs and all these other wonderful things, and I, you know, it does bring me joy and I feel good about it. This is better, okay? I'll, I'll leave that with you right there. And I wanna leave you also with a challenge to do something difficult. So do, set a goal to accomplish something big. Set a goal out there. And, and I always tell folks, uh, I was raised to set goals. I was raised to write down my goals. I take it a step further and I want you, I would encourage you if you set your goal, tell somebody significant in your life. Tell a brother, a sister, a roommate, clergy, parents, whoever it happens to be, share that goal with them because if that goal uh, is meaningful to you, it should be meaningful to them and they should help you want to accomplish, uh, accomplish that goal. Sound good? Okay, thank you guys and namaste. namaste. Okay. Yeah, that is, a, that is a good question, and I'm not sure, people have asked that question before, and I've thought about it a lot, and I don't have, I wish I had like a snappy good answer for you. It's just in me, and I will just, I will tolerate, I'm not going to risk my life, but I'll tolerate just about everything and anything that, that could be thrown at me. So you definitely feel, when you, when you leave Camp 4, people have asked, how do you feel, you know, what do you have to do, what does it take to climb the mountain, and I'll throw this out to you. When you leave camp four, you definitely feel like you have a mild flu. You, you know, you may have been throwing up. You just don't feel good. So think about the last time you kind of had the flu and didn't feel good. You have to get your body to the point where you can run a marathon feeling like that. And it, it, th this is a weird hobby. There's a lot of suffering and you just have to get comfortable with kind of that suffering. So you just kind of have to push yourself yourself through that. And it's gonna, it's, it, it comes from years of, uh, I, I'm not saying that I suffer, <laughs> you know, but it, you just have to be able to put up with that and, and get through that. And uh, I read a, a book recently uh, called Grit. 
if you've, if you've heard or read about that book. And I really was touched by that book, uh, but it, it's, I can't remember the author right now. Your sister actually gave it to me. And uh, it, it's, what is it? Angela Duckworth. Angela Duckworth, that's exactly it. Great book. And it, it talks about kind of digging deep and getting gritty and just being able to, to put up with, with, with things and kind of dig through. So, yep, good, good question. Any other questions? Yeah. <clears throat> and I should have asked, did that answer your question? Was that okay? All right. <laughs> so um, you mentioned how like, you would never risk your life, but how do you like, measure like, risk during the war? And, like, yep. Is there any other like, new times like, that you're climbing when you're calculating that? Yeah, all the time. So I, have, I, I would definitely say that I've spent enough time outdoors and in the mountains. I'm really comfortable with my tolerance for cold and I, I'm really comfortable that if I get in over my head, I'm gonna turn around and come back down. And it's just come with experience and getting comfortable with, with myself. Uh, people have asked that before and uh, I usually tell folks that if you, for instance, if you got a fear of heights or if you're not comfortable with the ladders, uh, that is not the place to learn and you should not be up there because the minute you start fearing those kinds of things when you're up there, you're gonna fall. And so you have to be so comfortable with that from climbing other mountains, having other experiences that it doesn't even, it doesn't even come into play. You know, I'll stand, and I, I think fortunately for me, I was born with no fear of heights, so it doesn't bother me whatsoever. And uh, I'll just kind of stand on something and I could have a normal conversation. I realize that's not everybody's cup of tea. I have an extreme fear of needles, which is totally irrational. So I, <laughs> I, I do understand irrational fear, <laughs> but uh, it, it, you know, you just have to get past that and feel comfortable with it. But I, I have absolutely turned around before. I, I ran an A in backcountry ski a lot and I've gone up on things and get up there and kind of look and you know what, this just from an avalanche standpoint, it doesn't, it doesn't feel right. You know, my, as Spider-Man says, my spidey senses are tingling the, you know, one way or another, I'll just back away and come back down and live another day, right? So I don't, I don't need to push it. And the mountain's always gonna be there. I, I like the mantra, uh, getting to the top is optional, getting down is mandatory, if you've ever heard that before. So I, I like that mantra. So you gotta be safe about these things. You gotta, you gotta return to tell the tale, right? Yeah, good, good question. Oh boy. <laughs> I, already, I already know the answer to this question, but uh, after the moon, what's your next goal? Oh, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. What is the answer? What do you think is the answer? Help you? No. <laughs> oh, I do. I would. I wouldn't mind going to Mars, but I. I don't mind. Yeah, that's a good comment. Uh, I'm 51, so I. I think probably I have about 10 years of fitness left where I could, it's, it's tremendously difficult to go to outer space, all the G-forces, and you've got to be physically fit. And you know, the, you just got to face the facts that at a certain age, you're not gonna be able to do that anymore. And so right now, I think I've probably got about 10 years of, uh, I'm hopeful anyway, of fitness left in me. So I think within the next 10 years, I, I would be fit enough to go to the moon. Uh, I'll let you go to Mars. I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll pave the way and let you or Porter or somebody else go to Mars. How does that sound? I would love to go, but I just don't, I don't, in, in the next 10 years, I think it's super realistic that I, I predict in the next five years, you're going to have more and more people on the moon. This is not a political comment, but I've definitely read that if President Trump uh, wins the next election cycle, his, one of his goals is have man on the moon by uh, 24 before he leaves office. So I think you're gonna see this big push and growth from uh, Elon Musk, from uh, uh, Blue Origin, from Amazon, from Bezos. You're gonna see all these people starting to push to go to the moon and to outer space. I, I think it'll be certainly within your lifetime and way before. So I, I'm, I'm thinking the next five, 10 years, huge rush uh, of people going. I think right now we're, we're think back to uh, Lindbergh, uh, Charles Lindbergh, he flew across the Atlantic for the first time, he was the first human to do that. He flew from New York to Paris, stopped in uh, Ireland. Prior to that, people were freaked out about flying across water. And he showed that you could do it. And that opened up airline travel to everybody in here. I th I'm sure everybody in here has, has either traveled throughout the United States or traveled uh, 
you know, uh, intercontinentally. And so I, I think we're right on that precipice right now of space travel. And it's, you know, all it's going to take is a couple people to go there and say, hey, we can do this. And then it'll open up the door to more and more people going and colonizing and things like that. So stay tuned. We'll see what happens. Right on. Yeah, good, good question. Any, any other questions? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that is a great question, and you and you absolutely. I have definitely had uh, failures in in my life and in my climbing life, and you can't let those get you down. You can't get frustrated by them. Uh, if if you do, you're just you're kind of failing yourself. So learn from that, get up and just keep progressing, keep moving forward. So uh, I, I shared with the group earlier that it took me two times. Denali was the only mountain that took me two times to, to go up. The first time I went up, I, I went with uh, an individual, he's an emergency room doctor, and I had met him the year before in Russia. So I didn't really kind of know him, uh, but he was an American guy. And uh, he had, unknown to me, he had developed pneumonia uh, about three weeks before we left. He was an emergency room doc, so he was prescribing medicine to suppress it, so I didn't know that he had pneumonia. Uh, you can only hide that so far. When you're at 15,000 feet and you start having coughing fits and blood comes out, it's a problem. And so we turned around. It was very frustrating because I had done everything I could do, and the other guy had done everything he could do to get into position. It, this isn't just as something as simple as setting a, you know, getting an airplane ticket and going. You're like planning a year in advance and getting fitness and everything, so it's very frustrating. Uh, to me, it was really maddening. Uh, maybe you can see that coming out of me a little bit. <laughs> uh, but we had to turn around. He was he was nice. He said, "Hey, you can put me in a tent and go summit and come back and get me." And I thought, "No, we can't just put you in a tent to die. You're, we're going to take you down." And as it was, we barely got him down. So uh, thankfully, I went back the next year and I and I summited. But I was frustrating for a year uh, that somebody had, you know, it was totally out of my control. And that's life sometimes, right? You. You can't control everything. There's no way you can. So uh, for me, if it was the weather, I could have digested that a little bit better. But this was somebody that I was relying on on our team that did that. And so I have not climbed with him since. I have communicated with him a little bit, but I'm not ever going to climb with him again. So yeah. <laughs> good, good question. Maybe one more and we'll call it good, or are we good? You guys are asking very thought-provoking questions. Usually I speak to... Uh, like youth groups, and they ask the silliest questions. How do you go to the bathroom? <laughs> the answer is you don't, because at that elevation, uh, nothing comes out of you. Your body is holding on to every calorie it can get. So, um, so what was the toughest part about the preparation? For Everest or for, you know, for me, 100%, it was the emotional uh, toll of leaving my family. It was super difficult for me because I had three boys at home and my wife, we're going to have my wife stand and everybody say hi to her. Yes, Linda, I want you to stand up. <laughs> Let's give Linda a round of applause. <laughs> so uh, I absolutely will say that uh, I am not going to summit any of these mountains without uh, the support of my wife and my family, it's just not going to happen. And I would not want to go if I didn't have their support and buy-in. And it, they all said, absolutely, we want you to go. We're supportive of you. But it's really hard for me to leave because I've been gone for a couple months. And I, I, I am a very hands-on, responsible dad. And it was killing me you know, to be away from them and not be there as part of their, their life. So it was very difficult for me to be. That was, honestly, that was the hardest part. Is, is being away from them. Physically, I, I managed it. You know, it was, in, it was definitely within, I was, I was getting close to the end of my physical ability, but I wasn't quite there yet. But I could, I could look over the edge and see it. You know, I was about, just about there. So, and I, so I was comfortable that I had done enough prep and got where I needed to be. 